So, ladies and gentlemen, I promised live hacking, and even before the live talk debugging. really started, yeah, we had a, a good portion of live hacking here. Matthias, he comes from Copenhagen. I first met him last year in Berlin on the JSConf EU, and uh, I have to confess, really, that he gave the best talk, at least that I was uh, participating, and it was crazy. A crazy uh, live hacking session with BitTorrent protocol and and some mad science, and so I thought uh, it would be an absolutely great opportunity to invite uh, Matthias here to Munich, and uh, so he accepted the invitation. He was already here yesterday evening for the Enlock with a um, talk about pipe streams and distributed systems. So, who was there yesterday? So. But today we get another talk. Yeah. So that's really absolutely amazing, and it will be the the new version of the talk you gave last year in Berlin. So, without further ado, a warm and heartily welcome to you, Martin Tosh, here in Munich. We are very pleased to have you. Just emptying out my pockets. So. Um. Okay, so before I start, at some point when nothing works, just tell me to go to the first terminal because that's where I just get my debugging thing fixed up. Um, so that's, that's for you guys to help me remember, remember that. Uh, yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, this is uh, going to be some new stuff I've been working on. And when I say new stuff, I mean I've been mostly working on it uh, this week, uh, most of it. So it's fresh off the presses, and you know we might have some fun things breaking down, which is, which is always great. Um, it's going to be about peer-to-peer uh, -peer and live streaming. So yeah, hopefully everything will work. So yeah, um, like I said, I'm, uh, or like Christoph says, I'm, uh, I'm Matthias. I go by uh, uh, Marventosh on GitHub Twitter. Um, and um, I work on a project called the Dead Project, uh, which is then open source, grant funded uh, project where we try to build tools for distributing and versioning uh, data sets, uh, mostly for scientific purposes. Um, and we tend to do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer stuff there as well, so it's great. Uh, it means I get to work on you know, all these kind of things all the time. So when I was writing these slides the other day, I kind of realized that I've been working on peer-to-peer -peer for a while now. Um, the first project I did was something called Peerflix, which is a streaming uh, BitTorrent client. And I was just, uh, yesterday I was going to my GitHub trying to find the first commit, and I noticed that it was uh, two years ago, which for me seemed uh, crazy because I, it feels like I just started that. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's two years and it's two tech years, right? So if you convert that to normal work years, it's like eight years, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so. I feel like I'm getting experience now in this field anyway, but who knows? So, uh, so why peer-to-peer? -peer? Well, peer-to-peer -peer is super interesting because it's such a different field of com computing compared to everything else because it has some really interesting properties that not that many other things have uh, in computing. So, for example, peer-to-peer -peer allows us to build systems that has no censorship built in. So, what, what do I mean by that? I mean Peer-to-peer, -peer, it's already, it's kind of in the name, right? It's systems where you communicate between two peers or more peers. So there's not a guy in between saying you can't say that or that's not allowed or whatever. And so this is for better and for worse. There's a bunch of really bad peer-to-peer -peer projects out there uh, where people share some really bad stuff. But there's also some really cool peer-to-peer -peer projects out there where people share some really cool stuff. So super interesting uh, property. We got this thing, no ownership. Um, Nobody owns a peer-to-peer -peer system if it's built right. We got plenty of systems that call themselves peer-to-peer -peer that people own, but if you build them right, there's no ownership. That means that you know you can put it out there, and there's a good chance it's going to live on forever if it's popular, because uh, there's not a centralized guy owning this. <coughs> Some people might argue that people own the content we share sometimes, but um, who cares? Um, this is also really cool. Um, Peer-to-peer -peer systems are usually free, uh, in the sense that uh, nobody's paying for you know bandwidth uh, or servers. I used to have a startup where we did um, file sharing online through centralized servers or like a cluster of centralized servers. 
And that's actually where I got really interested in peer-to-peer -peer because there I experienced firsthand that when you scale the business, you kind of scale your cost as well. The more customers you had, the more cost you had sharing data because you had to pay for bandwidth and you had to pay for servers. And I immediately thought if we could just take away that cost, our business would be way better because that means that every new customer we would get would just be, you know, more money. Um, so that's really interesting. And as soon as things are free, it also allows us to build way more interesting and cool stuff. It means that any of you guys can go home and write a peer-to-peer -peer system and just put it out there and not worrying about a bandwidth bill coming back and hitting you in the ass. They also tend to be really scalable in the sense that um, if you deploy it and one person uses it, it's fine. But if 10 persons use it, it's 10 times as good because it's peer-to-peer, -peer. at least if you build it right. If you build it wrong, there's plenty of reasons why this, this is not true. Um, so, so yeah, so <coughs> I feel like people tend to confuse this a lot and I'm gonna make my best to confuse you even more. So peer-to-peer -peer and BitTorrent is kind of into, into tween these days. Uh, I've been staying a lot at uh, different hotels recently and I've been no noticing that sometimes when you check in, they have this disclaimer on their check-in form that says, hey, we got free internet, but by the way, you cannot use peer-to-peer -peer systems. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? Can I not communicate directly to another peer over your Wi-Fi? And what they mean is, no, you cannot download illegal movies, right? Because you know, they, don't, they don't want to get sued, and I, I get that. So peer-to-peer -peer is kind of intertwined with stuff like BitTorrent and file sharing, for better and for worse, um, which is kind of sad. And one of the consequences of this is that we keep making new words because old words Become, familiar, become uh, familiarized with uh, piracy. So for example, I have some friends that now don't say seed anymore because seed instantly means seeding a movie, right? So you start saying uh, share or serve content. Um, so it, it, it turns into this legal game, right? That's kind of sad. Um, and even though stuff like BitTorrent is a really cool protocol, it's so inter intertwined with stuff like piracy that, uh, you know, it, the whole space becomes really messy in that sense. So anyways. OK, so, so let's talk about BitTorrent for a second. Uh, so first of all, this is going to be just a quick overview of BitTorrent. If you're really interested in how it works, uh, I would suggest that you look up uh, some of my earlier talks. I've done a lot of talks on this where I go into a way greater detail. Uh, you can just search for my username and on uh, YouTube, and I'm sure something will come up. <coughs> um, so yeah, anyways. So torrents, right, usually deals with static data. So what do I mean by static data? I mean you have a file or multiple files and you pack them into a torrent. Uh, and this torrent now points to these files. But it's static files. It's like you know, static content, right? Um, it's not a live stream or anything. And uh, I think most people get this because they're used to you know, downloading something over BitTorrent and they get a file out. And Recently, I've been noticing that whenever I speak about BitTorrent, there's always at least a couple of guys afterwards to come up to me and like, hey, cool thing about this BitTorrent thing. Um, we had this problem where we, you know, we're sharing stuff on BitTorrent or you know, we're building this peer-to-peer -peer system. And we were wondering if you have any uh, suggestions how we can update the content of our torrent, right? So maybe they have a torrent consisting of a terabyte of data. And then somebody says, hey, let's update that uh, terabyte of data to be a terabyte and one kilobyte. Can we just update that torrent so just we get that extra kilobyte, right? And uh, it turns, turns out you can't. Um, and here's why. So <coughs> let's look at how you know, BitTorrent works from a user's point of, view, point of view, and maybe it'll make sense why we cannot do this. So how, do you, how, does, how does BitTorrent work from a user's point of view? Right? Why? Uh, so let's say you wanted to find some content. So what you do is, first you, you, know, you get your computer, you open up a web browser or something, and you go to your um, favorite torrent site. Could be the Pirate Bay, it could be any site, it could be Facebook, if people share torrents there, it doesn't matter. Just anywhere people share torrents. And um, by actually going to this site, you establish one of the most important things in BitTorrent, you establish trust. And it sounds really weird that you now trust the Pirate Bay, but you do. You put it into your freaking browser, you put HTTP, Pirate Bay, whatever suffix they're using these days for they're not taking down. And you click enter, and you hope that this is the Pirate Bay. And you trust that site. Um, you then go into a search field or whatever, 
and you, you search for content. So you're like, let me find the latest Ubuntu uh, that I want to download. And you find that torrent. Um, <clears throat> and you then, you, then, you then download it. And here's the thing, by now downloading this torrent on a side, you now trust this torrent. <coughs> so what I meant before was you trusted the side, and since you trust the side, you now trust this torrent. And this is very important. So this is the entire bootstrapping of, the, uh, of security in BitTorrent. So you now get this torrent file downloaded, right? And you trust it. You trust that this, this was the torrent file that you know, is related to my search that I just searched for. So what does this torrent file contain? Well, it contains a list of hashes, and these hashes point to fixed chunks of the content that is being shared, right? So if somebody is sharing Ubuntu, uh, what the torrent pro uh, protocol did when it created the torrent file was that it took that uh, ISO image and it divided it into small chunks, and it hashed every chunk. <coughs> so for example, it just picks a chunk size that's appropriate. Uh, and if it's a small torrent, it's 512 kilobyte usually, but if it's a big torrent, it can be anywhere between a megabyte or 10 megabytes. So it takes the file and puts it into these small chunks and hashes every one of them. And for every chunk, it produces a hash, right? Um, so for example, if our chunk size is, up, is 512 kilobytes, we're gonna ha have um, the file size divided by 512 kilobytes chunks. We take all these chunks and we put them into a torrent file. And since we now <coughs> uh, trust this uh, torrent file, we kind of trust that these hashes are correct. So this is all based on us trusting the Pirate Bay, basically. By entering our browser and putting in the Pirate Bay, we now trust these hashes. Um, and the torrent also has an ID, and that's just the hash of everything. And that makes it really easy to, easy, easy to reason about, because a hash of everything is also trustworthy, because you can then use that hash to verify the actual the torrent file content. right? So everybody getting this more or less a little bit? Is it too advanced? I see some people nodding. Some people probably afraid of saying no because of public shaming. That's all right. So yeah, so, so we got all these hashes, right? And what we can use them for is whenever we, we get the content from a peer, uh, we can just look up the appropriate chunk and check that it hashes to the same thing. And then we don't even need to trust the peer because we trust that torrent file. We can get the content from anybody. <coughs> but it has this really sad consequence also. It means that all content is fixed. Otherwise, this trust model wouldn't work because we're trusting a bunch of hashes and hashes are, are like fixed in time. So that means we cannot update the torrent file. By updating the torrent file, we're, we're putting more content in, we're changing that torrent ID and now the complete uh, chain is broken. So, so how do we fix that? <coughs> well, we just tell the user, hey, go to your computer, go to Pirate Bay, find a new torrent, and if you trust the Pirate Bay, that torrent is probably an update to the previous torrent, right? So I don't know if anybody has ever in their lifetime downloaded a movie of the Pirate Bay, but <clears throat> you see this flow where, you know, every time somebody publishes a movie, they publish, a, uh, sorry, a series, they publish a new episode every week, and you're like, why can't we just publish one torrent that's like the entire series, right? But we can't because of this reason. We have to publish a new turn every week, and that's why we have a bunch of duplicates also. But it, it, you know, it makes the turn simple, and it makes it work. So that's great. <coughs> but so here's the thing. This means that our nice distributed peer-to-peer -peer bit turn magic thing, it's kind of not peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Because we we need the Pirate Bay. We need the Pirate Bay in order to bootstrap this entire process. We need the Pirate Bay or any other turn side in order to get a new turn. If all torrent sites go, this goes down, we need to trust a new side. And usually we, we just trust the new side by clicking a random link on the internet that, that a friend gave us because we're craving for that new episode of Game of Thrones or whatever. Um, so you could argue that this, this, this model is almost kind of broken, right? I mean, BitTorrent itself works, but the user flow is kind of broken. So, so um, that's sad. So how can we fix this? Well, it's, it's trivial. Instead of having a centralized Pirate Bay, we just have a distributed Pirate Bay, right? So we just apply recursion, just distribute more stuff, and it works. So let's talk about how we can do that. So basically, we had this problem, and this is like, this is the kind of problem you can put in one line, and it's, you know, the solution is a million lines. Uh, so basically, we have a problem where we say, we have some content, 
it's probably a list of content. You know, we're publishing something, and then we're publishing something else, and then we're publishing something else. So it's the list of content. And we kind of want to distribute this. And we want to distribute this in a nice and user-friendly fashion. So that means, you know, uh, in the best case scenario, you're just kind of like a website. That's a really user-friendly thing to do. And if we can make this work, then we can kind of, you know, fix that BitTorrent problem where we have, we can bootstrap updates uh, and users just have to trust our distributed system somehow. And that the entire problem almost goes away, right? So how can we make it a uh, distributed list of content. <clears throat> well, it turns out it's pretty hard uh, because people. So if you have a distributed list, right, you guys are, are tech people. You know how hard it is to set up these message queues and all that kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pain in the ass because of consistency. Um, I know I've failed many times. Um, and it turns out it's really hard because of something called strong consistency. So do people know what strong consistency is? All right, I see some guy not uh, knowing what it is and a lot of people not wanting to admit that they know what it is. Um, so basically in consistency, consistency meaning that in a peer-to-peer -peer system, we're gonna have state, right? It's gonna be replicated. And not everybody necessarily agrees how this state looks. So strong consistency is a, is a, is a thing where we guarantee that <clears throat> the, every peer is going to have the same state at some point. Uh, no, at the, at the same point, more or less. So if one guy updates this list, everybody else is going to get this update. Um, and if, if it's a key values store, um, and a guy updates a, a key in this key value store, everybody else is going to get that key value at the same time. So we don't have conflicts. We don't have people updating the same key at the same time. That's, that, that, can hap that cannot happen in a strongly consistent system, usually. And the way you do this is that you just pick one of the peers and say, you're now the leader. And you send all updates to him. And he'll choose, you know, which one is the right one. Um, so <clears throat> most databases work like this because that makes our job as developers really, really easy. But, you know, imagine if we have a distributed system. And I'm not talking about, you know, data center distributed. That, that sucks. That's not distributed. I'm talking about, you know, World Wide Web distributed. We can't really elect a leader because it's the World Wide Web. I mean, it's kind of like having a... A democratic election every hour uh, across the planet. It, it kind of doesn't work. Uh, so luckily there's this other term called um, eventual consistency that just guarantees at some point everybody will, will, will get all updates to this list. But, you know, there might be concurrent updates. People might have updated the list at the same, <coughs> at the same point in time. So we might have uh, conflicts. So lo let's look at how, at how that will look. So. Let's say we have a list, right? And it's, it's nice and ordered so far. So we have, a, we have a, a, a side and it contains a list of torrents. <clears throat> so it probably has a list like this where, you know, there's two torrents in there and a bunch more. Um, so let's say there's a peer, peer one, and he adds an item. So he just takes this list and he appends it to the bottom, right? It's fine, still ordered. But at the same time, another peer comes in and he adds another item to, to the end of the list, but he, hadn't, he hasn't gotten the first peer's update yet, right? So he adds D prime, and the previous peer added just D. So what happens is now that if we, if we go and take an above look of this list now, it kind of looks like this, right? So if people use Git, they're kind of familiar with this situation. It's, kinda, it's like a conflict, right? But here's the thing. We're talking about a list, right? And it's a list of torrents. Order doesn't matter. Who cares? Who cares if D is the right one or D prime is the right one? As long as we see both, we're fine. So it's really easy to solve this because if another peer inserts a node, he just auto merges. He just puts two pointers to the previous one and says, you know, this is now the new one. And the really cool thing about this is that we still have causality. We can still infer that E was inserted after D and D prime because it's lower down in the list. Right? We can also infer that C was inserted before, uh, after B, and B was inserted after A, right? So we get this ordering. We don't have an ordering between D and D prime, but who cares? It doesn't matter. It's just torrents. I mean, it's user is going to search anyway. <coughs> so here's the thing. It's a distributed system, so people can cheat. I mean, uh, some lawyer guy can come in and be like, hey, the list is now empty. And, you know, they solve their problem. Nobody can share any content anymore. 
So that sucks. So um, how can we fix that? Well, easily. We can make this small hack. So what if in our list we just make every node hash all previous co content and put that hash in that list, right? So it kind of looks like this. So you have the first turn, that's, the f that, that's A, that's the first one. So that's no, that's no previous one. So that's just content. But when you insert B, <clears throat> you also insert a hash of the value of, uh, of A and the value of B. When you insert C, you take that previous hash, B's hash, and you hash the content we're gonna insert to C and you put that in. And when you insert D and D prime, we do the same thing. And down here in the, when we have a fork and we merge, we do the same thing where we, you know, hash uh, D and D prime and hash the content of B and we insert that. <clears throat> so the really cool thing about this is that, oh yeah, by the way, we call this a Merkle DAG, uh, DAG being a directed acyclic graph, which is a cool term that I just learned. Uh, Merkle because it's, it's, a, it's a hash graph and Merkle is, uh, is a guy who invented these kind of things. Um, so <clears throat> the cool thing about this is that if you have, if you have the E node, right, you can kind of verify the entire list because the E node implicitly hashes the entire list before you, right? So if you get the E node, the, the newest one, and you trust that one, you can get the D node from anybody and the D prime node from anybody and you can hash, oh, this hashes up to the E node, the value of the E node, if you get the content also. And if you have the D node and the D prime node, you can get the C node from anybody and you know, verify that that works, right? So we just have to trust the latest node in the list and we trust the entire list. And we can kind of uh, check that the content is the correct one. <coughs> um, so this is a real cool uh, data structure. So I implemented this recently because this is also something we use in a lot of databases. And a node module called Hyperlog um, and then implements exactly this data structure in Node. Um, so let's try to use that and build a distributed. Uh, you don't. Uh, it's append only. So there's a hack you can do where instead of storing content into the list, you just store pointers. So a pointer being another hash. So now the, the overhead of inserting something is only 20 bytes or whatever your hash is. So it's pretty minimal. Uh, you can also do a thing where you archive previous lists. So you can just have a list per month. And then at the end of the month, you just truncate it into you know, whatever you want to have there. And you make a new list, and that's the first node. So there's a bunch of ways to, to get around this uh, garbage collection problem. But in the simplest solution, you just don't care. I mean, disk is cheap. Who cares? I mean, we're going to share a gigabyte file anyways, right? So a gigabyte divided by 20 bytes is a shitload of hashes anyway. Uh, but it's a good question. Actually, most peer-to-peer -peer stuff works by just not removing stuff, honestly. So yeah, so let's try to use this to build a distributed torrent index side, because that's fun. So I'm going to boot up my editor. We did a bunch of live coding yesterday, and it kind of worked OK. So I'm hoping it's going to work OK today as well. Um, so it's going to be JavaScript, because we're going to make it run in the browser. Because, you know, the browser is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the browser is one of these things where people don't realize you go in there, you have a URL bar, you type something in, you're now access, accessing a distributed system. How cool is that? Even my mom knows how to do that. Um, we take that for granted all the time, but it's amazing. So I just made a index. I think I should switch this to a light theme. I think I forgot to do that yesterday. That's probably way easier for people to see. Is this white? No. Why can't you just call this thing white? Uh, light theme. Whoa. That's easy to see, right? So, console log, hello world. We're almost there. <laughs> so what we do is we first install, um, actually, let's check that this actually works in the browser. So we have a con hello world here. Uh, there's this really cool node module called wizard, or just WZRD, that you can just pass a, 
uh, JavaScript file, and it runs the server, and you can copy this URL, and then you can open my web browser, and you can just load this URL, and what it will do is it will just automatically browserify this file for you. Uh, and run your code, right? So we can very easily test stuff in the browser. That's really cool. Um, so let's install Hyperlog. So <clears throat> Hyperlog works in the browser because it's JavaScript. So how does it work in the browser? Because it's gonna, it's gonna need to st st uh, store some state, right? We need to store that, that list. Well, it uses something called uh, LevelDB. Do people know LevelDB? All right, so LevelDB is this really cool project that Google, Google built. It's a key value store uh, that does very few things, which is awesome. Things that does few things are awesome, especially databases, because no, most databases does a bunch of shit wrong. And uh, that's why they don't work. So level to be is awesome. Uh, so level to be is awesome because, oops, I need to put install here. <coughs> because it only supports uh, puts and gets and streams. And the only thing you can do in a stream is you can say, give me everything from this key to this key. And it's, uh, and it's sorted, right? So you can say, give me everything from B to C and then gives you everything in the range between B to C. Um, and that's it. And it turns out you can build any database on top of this. And it only works on one process on one machine, which is also awesome because, you know, fewer things are great. Um, and that's, also, that's already really hard. Um, so how do you use it? You just require it, you install it from, level, uh, from NPM, there's one called Level Browser Fi that works in the browser because the browser has Level DB. Wow, amazing. So you just require it, you give it a path to your file system. I'm just going to call this DB uh, demo. And what you can do here is you can just do put hello world. So if I run this guy, oops, too many programs. Oh, it inserted it, but it didn't print anything out because we're just putting something. Hopefully it inserted it. And you can then get the value out by doing a get. That's it. And as you can see here, it created this folder called dbdemo. So if I want to remove my database, I just do like this. I think that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and like I said, it works in the browser. So let's try to br uh, browserify this guy. So run this ad, compile the browser. Didn't print anything because we didn't have any console logs. And we can't do this in the browser. I don't know why I restarted that one, didn't matter. And it prints out world, right? And if I run it again, the browser, it still prints out world because it's a database. We're persisting stuff, right? So a really fun fact about LevelDB, so LevelDB is Google's lowest level component in something called uh, BigQuery or Bigtable. I think Google does, that's a huge distributed database. LevelDB is like the small primitive they use to store things on disk and that thing. And they actually also added it to Chrome because they wanted to implement a spec called IndexDB. Do people know IndexDB in the browser? So IndexDB in the browser is, is this uh, web standard that creates a data where you can create a database in the browser. And it's horrible. It's like one of the worst things ever to come out of the web standards. It's, you know, you need 80 lines of code to do a hello world in a database. And the fun thing is that Google used LevelDB internally in Chrome to in implement IndexDB. So what some people did was that, you know, they said IndexDB, that kind of sucks. So they re-implemented LevelDB on top of IndexDB and put that on APM. So, so if you install Level Browserify, you're using LevelDB on top of IndexDB that then in turn runs on top of LevelDB natively. So it's like too much inception, but it works and it's really, really fast. Okay, anyways, back to this. So we have a LevelDB, it works in the browser. The only thing we need to do now is create a hyperlog. 
and create a log instance where we just pass this DB. And you can just append stuff to this log and then you can create a read stream to this log where you get these values out again. So let's just try to do that. And let's put a date stamp here so we know what we're doing. So we're just appending random message to our log. We have a stream to our log that just prints out everything that's in the log. And there's this really cool thing, Hyperlog, where you can say live uh, true. So it's a, it's a live restream. It keeps reading from that log. It's kind of like a message queue almost. So let's try to run this guy. Just going to put a dash one here so I can clear it. I don't know how to remove a database in the browser yet, so I just changed the name. <laughs> so as you can see, we inserted a value. Uh, if I run it again, hopefully it inserts two values. It has to compile browser fight this every time. So that's kind of cool, right? Um, <clears throat> so, so far our app doesn't really do anything. We're just appending something to a database in the browser. Who cares? But the really, really cool thing about Hyperlog is that it has this method called replicate. And what that does is it returns a stream that I can just pipe to another stream uh, that points to another Hyperlog. And those two Hyperlogs will start to replicate using a really smart um, replication protocol that kind of works like Git does, where it just exchanges a small diff of what, of what uh, the, the one peer has and what the other peer has. And eventually, they'll be in sync. So where should we pipe this thing? Uh, it's the stream, right? But we don't really have anywhere to pipe it. Well, it turns out it's really easy to make peer-to-peer uh, -peer connections in the browser because we got something called WebRTC. Do people know WebRTC? So WebRTC is, is, is a stack in the browser that allows you to do peer-to-peer -peer connections to anybody in the world, as long as they also have WebRTC, which means uh, Chrome or Firefox. And I think IE is also adding it now. <coughs> so there's this really cool node module called WebRTC Swarm that just allows you to create a bunch of WebRTC connections. Uh, and they just need a signaler. They need somebody who can like tell these other guys where people are running, kind of like a tracker, and that's called a signal hub, um, to find each other. So if we just comment this out for a second, what we can do here now is we can say, let's require the swarm, and let's require the signal hub. And let's create a swarm and a hub. So the signal hub just uses an HTTP server right now to, or a bunch of HTTP servers to route messages between each other. So you can give it, you know, 80 servers, and they just send, they just need to send a small ping to each other to figure out where they are in the world. So we can make a distributed list of peers, and we're gonna call this app test demo. So what you do is you create one of these hubs, you just pass that to the swarm thing, and the swarm will emit this cool event called peer. Got peer. So we just create a swarm that uses WebRTC. It coordinates each other using the signal hub I have running on my server. It can be any signal hub or a million of them. And it just emits an event every time uh, two peers find each other called peer. So let's just try to run this. Oops, I forgot to run the wizard guy. <coughs> so this guy is compiling now and nothing happens because we're only one guy. We got no peers to talk to. But hopefully, if I open a new tab and it compiles, this other guy will say, hey, I got a peer now because somebody else joined the network. And the two, the two guys are signaling each other using a, a signal hub. And this guy also got a peer, right? And if we open a new tab, 
and it compiles, we see that little spinner, it's a bit blurry up there, but we got a new peer again, so we got two peers here, and we got two peers here, right? So that's cool. So if we go back to our code thing here, the only thing we need to do now here is this peer is actually a stream, it's just a duplex stream, so if I write to this peer, it will emit data on the other end. So I can just take our example from before, paste this guy up here, and then down here I can just put peer pipe log replicate it's going to be a live replication. We want to continue replicating, not just do it once. Pipe peer. So every, every time the peer emits some data, we pipe it into our replication stream. Every time the replication stream uh, emits some data, we pipe it back into the peer. So it's kind of connecting these two peers. You see this kind of syntax all over distributed systems in Node, where you just you know, have a transport stream. It's called a peer. You just pipe that to some sort of uh, database or whatever. So let's save this and try to run it and see what happens. So restart uh, this guy. He still has, to, you know, we're still reading the, the events from the database. And if I now restart this other tab, <coughs> hopefully they'll find each other. And they're now exchanging these messages, right? So I can see here these first three messages were the ones we added in the other tab. And this guy also got a new message uh, just now. <coughs> so they both have four messages. So the thing is, the order of these messages might not be the same because it's eventual consistent. We cannot guarantee ordering because it's a distributed system and it's across the web, right? But that doesn't matter, who cares? So hello world messages are kind of, you know, sad thing to distribute. We can just call each other and say hello world instead. Um, so let's distribute something more fun. So let's install this other cool module. This is basically just me installing other people's stuff and taking credit. But uh, there's this other cool module called, I wrote some of them also, so it's fine. I get some credit also. Uh, there's this other cool module called drag and drop files that allows you to drag and drop files uh, on a, in a browser. I love these modules that just call what it, they do. So after you drag and drop files, what do you need to do? You need to read files. So how do you read files? You install file reader stream because that's a stream that reads files. And then we get a stream out, but what do we need to do with a stream? We need to concat it, right, into one buffer so we can work with it. So how do we do that? We just install concat stream. <coughs> so let's just require more stuff. Drop, drag, and drop files. Uh, file reader. The hardest thing about Node is what to call this, this variable over here sometimes. When these, like, you cannot call it drag and drop files. It's a bit of a long name. So you have to choose a word. So you have to pick like the best word. I like drop here because that kind of fits. But anyway, that's a really hard problem in Node. Uh, and we need to require a concat. So what we can do now is we can just say drop. When somebody drops something on our window, we get a bunch of files back. And we just want the first one, and we want to read that. And we just, that returns a, a stream of the file that somebody dropped. We just want to pipe that into uh, concat, and then we get a single buffer out. And let's just console log that. So this magic line here that just used a bunch of modules allows us to drag and drop a file on our web page. So let's try to see if that even works. So, refresh this guy. Still loads. And then, uh, just gonna take a random file here, drag and drop that, and you can see here, you know, it's printing out that file over here, it was the JavaScript file I dropped. So that's awesome. But we don't wanna drag and drop, we just don't, we don't wanna just print files out, we wanna share these files. These files are gonna be small, it's probably gonna be torrent files, right? So we don't care, we just append that to the log. So what we do is we just say um, log append, and we're just gonna, for now, we're just gonna JSON stringify it because that's really easy. 
you probably want to use like a binary format if you want to do this for real. The name is file zero name. That's the name of the file. The browser gives us that. Uh, the data is the data. We're just going to base 64 for now because it's, it's, uh, it's JSON. Like I said, we don't care about these things right now. Um, and then we probably want to remove this guy. We don't want to add any more hello worlds. And let's use a new database. So, thank you. Should use a static language instead, I guess. So let's rebuild this side. Uh, that was weird. Just gonna bump this again. Ah, <laughs> did you see what happened? So I just I changed the database, right? But it's still printing out, it's still printing out the hello world messages. And I was like, why is it still printing out these hello world messages? Because I, I changed the database. So the problem is it's a distributed system already. So I had this other browser running here that's actually seeding this old database. And this, our new database came online and found this peer and it started replicating the old data. So I couldn't, I cannot delete it. Uh, so what I need to do is I need to uh, close this browser or make the system, the system better. So it's like indestructible, that's kind of cool. Um. <coughs> so let's just rebuild this again. <coughs> So drag and drop a file. It's printing out this file here now. And if I open a new browser, <coughs> hopefully they'll replicate, right? So cool, almost there. We're now replicating files using our log. So the only thing we need to do is add some, some front end magic. So we, like the console is not that user friendly. We, wanna, we have a web page, we wanna kind of display it. So luckily that's trivial. We just say, let's pass that JSON value out again. And then document body append child div, and let's make a div. This is me doing front end. You can probably add some React or something here if you really wanna over engineer it. In our HTML, that's kind of cool, so easy. And uh, let's make an an ref, right? Because it's a link, it's gonna be a link. So there's this attribute called download that allows you to set the file name of a, of a download link. So the file name is gonna be uh, the name of the file. And we're gonna put the name as the value also. And um, we need an href. Let's see if I can remember this syntax. We want to make it a data data link, right? A base 64 bit data link. You can do that in HTML. And I'm pretty sure it's like data uh, application octet stream. I'm just putting stuff here now. I know I don't know what I'm doing. Like this maybe? Uh, both places? Somewhere is the same. Uh, yeah, I think you're right about that. Let's just try this until it works. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's finite amounts. Worst case, I'll go to Wikipedia. Uh, and we got the data here. So, if I refresh this guy now. <coughs> We get a link here called test.js because I, I drag and drop test.js. And if I click this, it did something. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> so I guess it wasn't. Uh, ah, so it downloaded this, my base64 string. That's not the file. So I clearly have a typo here. I bet it's because um, this guy needs to be a semicolon. This guy do needs to be a comma or something. Let's try that. Otherwise, I'll go to Wikipedia and look it up real quick. 
I don't know why data URLs had to be so difficult to use. Ah, all right. So that worked. Mm -hmm. So we can share a list of files now. Uh, and if we open another browser and we refresh this guy, <coughs> hopefully our site will replicate, right? So, ah, okay, so Chrome is refreshing both, uh, resizing both at once. Anyways, so I have two browsers here that are replicating our list of files. If I go in here and I drag and drop uh, this other file, you can see here that it replicates, right? So that's cool. Um, so almost there. We have a site now that replicates uh, in the browser peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, but we still need to have a server running here for this thing to work. We still like we want to make this work in the browser, right? So we still need to have a server somewhere. That's that kind of sucks. Um, so how can we fix this? Well, first of all, let's try to compile this guy. So instead of using um, <clears throat> instead of using uh, wizard, let's make an, an HTML file. And then here, let's make a script tag. And let's browserify this for real. Browserify index.js. I'm just going to pipe it into PB copy so it goes into my clipboard. The clipboard is like one of the coolest things about a computer because it allows you to do stuff like copy paste. So I just compiled a HTML file. So this is our app compiled with browserify. So it, you know, it becomes big because dependencies. So. Uh, it's now 875 kilobytes, our small app here. We can probably gzip it, but let's not worry about that. So there's this really, really cool site called uh, um, HTML bin. And I cannot remember, the, is it .com maybe? Um, that Substack does. And basically, it's just a website that you can upload anything to. And what it does is that it takes the thing you'd upload and makes a share sum out of it. So it just hashes your content, serves that, and it adds uh, cache headers that just allows you to cache your content forever. Because it's, the link is gonna be a hash, it doesn't matter because a hash is always correct. Which in turn, in turn means that things are gonna work offline. So, I can't remember how it works like that, yeah. So what you do is you just take an HTML file and you just pipe that into, uh, I'll just put this up in the top. Take an HTML file and you just pipe it into HTML bin. That's it. And HTML bin will now upload this to <coughs> HTML bin and then we get this really cool link here that I can now just put into my browser. <coughs> and it's gonna, take a bit longer to load because it's 875 kilobytes, our website, right? But it replicates because it's the same site. And the cool thing is if I reload this, it's really fast because it just set the cache headers to cache everything forever, which also means that if I turn off my Wi-Fi here for a second, I can probably not get online now again. That's probably the curse. Mm -hmm. And go to the website, it still works because the cache, header, cache headers, right? So we have an offline website, but nobody knows that it's offline which is pretty awesome. So what you only need to do is you need to make a prettier UL and you know, it just works. So we now have a distributed uh, torrent index. Instead of sharing JS files, we can just share torrent files, right? So let's try to do that. Oh, I closed down my slides. I always do that. Do, 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 do. So let's see here. I think we got to this point. Yeah, so we have a list, we put stuff in the list. It's still not completely trustworthy, right? Because anybody can put stuff in this list. So you can easily fix this. You can just use uh, signatures. So just have trusted users. And the only thing you need to do is you need to, you need to sign the end of this list because by signing that last hash in this list, you kind of sign the entire list. So that's really easy to do. I'm just not gonna do that now because I don't care. So we can use this uh, index to search for all kinds of terms. So let's try to do that. Um, 
So, what should we search for? So I recently made a project called uh, Torrent Docker. Has anybody heard of that? Okay, that's good. So, do people know Docker? Right. So Docker is kind of cool because it allows you to to make these. Oh, I'm SSH into wrong machine. That's great. Uh, it allows you to build these very lightweight uh, virtual machines, right? Um, and uh, it's great because it allows you to sandbox everything. It allows you to install anything without ha how having to worry about dependencies. There's only one problem. It's insanely slow to download these images. Um, these images usually end up being a gigabyte because it needs basically needs to require all of Ubuntu in the worst case. And if you haven't downloaded that before, and you try to run some app that just says Hello World, it's going to download a gigabyte of data, and you just want to run freaking Hello World. So that kind of sucks. And also, Docker does this thing where it does a bunch of uh, round trips every time you push or pull something. So even though you're in sync, it takes forever. Um, so I got so tired of that that I decided to fix it. And the only, thing I think, the only way I knew how to fix it was to put it on BitTorrent. So what I did was I made a thing called Torrent Docker that you can install. It's on NPM. And it allows you to take any Docker image and uh, seed it over BitTorrent and live boot it uh, without having to download the entire thing. So it basically just, it just implements a file system where if you read from that file system, it only downloads exactly what is being asked for. Uh, it prioritizes, prioritizes that, but it downloads it over BitTorrent. So the more people who are actually using your virtual machine, the faster it runs. Um, so this is, this is a server. It's in uh, Holland. And it has a bunch of images. And I made this image earlier called test image. It takes a while to make an image, so I decided not to do that uh, here. I think it's called entry point. Uh, maybe not. Anyways, this image contains a node, and it runs a small server called a node server here that you can uh, access. And I cannot exit that for some reason. So I'm just going to boot into that machine again. Docker sometimes hijacks your uh, your um, your keys, so you cannot quit stuff, which is kind of annoying. Uh, Docker run test image entry point. Just gonna try it again. I think I messed up the command. There we go. So this is now a Docker image. I'm inside a Docker image, and uh, like I said, there is a. A server in here that just says uh, uh, hello from node. I got stuff like curl in here. I can curl drdk, that's a Danish website. And it's a Docker image. And uh, what I did was I exported this Docker image. There's a command in Docker where you can export that to a single table. And um, that's in here. So you can see this simple image, it just contains node and a small node app is almost 400 megabytes, right? So it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty big because it, it needs to, uh, Ubuntu to work. So what the torrent docker did was I ran this command called uh, create, and you can just pass that a docker image name that you have locally. And what I'll do is it, it'll export that uh, docker image to a tuple, and then it'll run through the tuple and index all the files in the tuple and make a small index of that that just contains all the file names and the sizes uh, and their like, permissions and that kind of thing. And I'll put that in a level DB. And since it's a level DB, it's just a small embedded database. You can just gzip that and put that into a file. So it puts that into a file here called index uh, tar gzip that's just around uh, 700 kilobytes. And this index describes all the offsets in this tuple as well. Um, so what we can do now, hopefully, is we can run, uh, oh yeah, and it produces this uh, torrent file. So what I first need to do is I need to download this torrent file. Because I need the torrent file in order to use it somewhere else. So I'm just going to download this torrent file.
And what we can do now is we can take this torrent file, we can put it on our distributed index, right? So somebody else can go in and download it. So let's say I did that. Um, I can then go into my server, I can call torn docker seed, put this in the top, keep forgetting that. So torn docker is now seeding this torn for us and it's saying it found two peers. I don't know why it says two peers, I think it found itself, but there's it's only one peer here. Um, it's probably just a bug, distributed systems. Uh, and it's just seeding this torrent. So hopefully, if Docker works, if my debugging worked earlier, I'm just gonna remove the cache so we don't cheat. I can now, on my local machine, I have, this is a Mac, so I have a boot to Docker running uh, with no modifications, and I install torrent Docker on this machine. So I can now, on this machine, call, I have the torrent here that we just downloaded. I can now run torrent docker boot uh, this torrent and I can give it a container name. So it's gonna call that demo. And I need a, just need a new shell because I need to attach to some output in a second. So if I run this, um, what will happen is, is that this torrent docker thing is finding our torrent seed and it's now downloading, uh, it's trying to boot bash in this uh, virtual machine and uh, bash is contacting the file system and telling it, oh, to run I need etc input RT, uh, RC and I need all these uh, libs. And once it has that, it, it boots uh, bash. So actually we just booted it, it took like three seconds, even though the, the container is 500 megabytes, we can boot it in three seconds because it's just fetching exactly what it needs, right? Um, so this is now still syncing in the background. So I can run stuff like ls in here, and it just fetches ls on demand. And I can run it again, and it's, 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 it's here. I can run node version. This is pretty fun. So if I run node version, you can see over here it's now, you know, syncing lib, all these kind of things over BitTorrent. And uh, node is a bit bigger than ls, so it's gonna take longer. So you can see I'm running a pretty old version of node here. And I can boot up our server so this is kind of fun. When I boot up our server, it actually needs to fetch more of the node binary because the node binary, in order to print the version, you don't need the entire node binary. You just need, you just need specific parts of it. And the file system is smart enough to figure that out. Um, so we can run node in here. And uh, I have no idea how to, to access this uh, server, so I'm just gonna fork it in the background. I don't know the IP because I just set it up. So, I can run curl. It, we didn't fetch curl yet, so it has to fetch it. It has to sync it. Um, so curl is apparently a little bit bigger. And it says hello from node. And if you, if you run it again, it just works. So the cool thing about this is that if you think about it, most uh, virtual machines share like 95% of all the content, right? Most virtual machines that we use in a normal commercial setting uses the same version of Node, the same version of Bash, the same version of Curl. So if we just share this cache between all our virtual machines, we'll be able to boot them in milliseconds, even though it's distributed. And the more, the more virtual machines you deploy like this, the fast everything runs because it's BitTorrent. So this guy over here, this guy here, is actually also seeding now. He's also seeding a virtual machine because it's BitTorrent. So if another guy joins, he'll be able to uh, re deliver those files again. Right? Uh, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> and I think this file system is writable even. Yeah, so you can write files here. So what it does when you write files is that it actually don't, it doesn't distribute these files over BitTorrent, it just writes these files locally and it does like a union file system where it, it reads first locally if you have the file, otherwise it reads it from BitTorrent. So if I read test out again here, you're just reading this file locally. Um, so yeah. So I don't know how much time I spend, but I can continue going. So we can distribute torrents. 
distributed. We can boot containers distributed. Everything's great. Uh, but I'm not satisfied because we still had the same problem that I talked about earlier. I mean, if we want to update this torrent, the actual content of this torrent, we still can't do it because um, torrents suck for that. So that's kind of sad. I, I really want, I have this project I really want to do. I really want to make a distributed television, right? I want to be able to make a television that you can just turn on, watch live video, and it's all distributed so everybody can make their own TV channel. Um, and I cannot use BitTorrent for that because I cannot update the torrent. And I have to make a new torrent every hour or something. And it's going to be really laggy because BitTorrent needs a few seconds to set up, you know, a connection swarm and that kind of thing. It's, it's just a hack. So I was talking to my friend Dominic about this. And uh, he uh, introduced me to this really cool idea. So it's going to be a bit technical now. I hope you bear with me. Uh, I just understood how this worked like last week after thinking about it for like a month. So if you don't understand it, don't worry about it. But I think it's the future. Honestly, it's not my idea right? also. <laughs> so if you remember earlier when I talked about how a torrent file looks, it kind of looks like this. You have, you have a torrent ID. It's a hash of a bunch of hashes. Just below this ID, you have all these hashes of all these fixed chunks, right? So we call this a single level Merkle tree because it's kind of like a tree but it's only has, it only has one level. And uh, if you get the top node, you can use that top node to verify everything else. Then you can use the top node to verify the, the level below you, the level below you points the data. You can uh, get it data from anybody and verify that it actually works. So the thing that sucks about this is that I cannot append a new hash to this, to this tree. If I append a new hash to this tree, this ID is gonna change, right? So the data structure kind of sucks. So how can we fix this? <laughs> this is where it becomes a little bit tricky. So I had some problems trying to write this down because it's a very a simple but complex idea. You can use a Merkle tree where all the nodes in the bottom kind of, you construct it so every node in the bottom verifies all the content below you, uh, before you. So basically, if all the bottom uh, nodes in your tree hashes all the trees before you, that you can just append something to the bottom and it keeps uh, verifying this entire tree. So it's very easy to, uh, very, it's very difficult to understand when I just say it out loud and I'm probably also explaining it really bad. So I decided to try to do an example so maybe we can come to agreement that it maybe works. So let's say we have a, a, a hash tree here um, and it kind of looks like this. You have two hashes, you have two data blocks, right? A and B. You insert A first, that's the zero node down here in the, in the left bottom. And you hash that. There's no previous tree, so you just hash that. Hash that. that is now our tree ID. And then you insert a new node called B. So when you insert a new node called B, you go backwards in this tree and look at all the trees before you. So the only tree before you is the, is the zero node. And you take that node and you hash that with the value of B. So now you get a hash of B, the data block, and the hash zero. So this hash kind of verifies both uh, the B block and the A block because it hashes the hash is the hash of uh, zero. And what we do what we do is after we insert this second hash, we make a hash of these two combined, and that's now the the tree hash, uh, the top hash in this tree. So when you add a new block, you just continue doing this. So let's say we want to add a block C. We just append that to the bottom. I'm going to be prematurely clever here and call that index four. Don't worry about that. And what you do is you just take the previous uh, tree. That's, uh, that's one. That's only one tree. That's, you can see the one points to both zero and two. You take that hash and you hash that with the, the hash of uh, C. And that's, the, that's the, the new bottom hash. So if you trust this hash here, you can both verify the, uh, the C data block and you can verify the, the hash uh, spanned out by the one node, which kind of verifies both A and B, right? So more interesting, if we add a new block, <clears throat> we just continue doing this. So let's say we want to add a new block called D. So if you look at the hash number six down here, uh, what it does now is that D looks up all the trees before it. So there was, there was actually two trees before it because the, the, tree, the previous trees looked like this. So there's the tree spanned by by one, and there's a tree spanned by four. It's just a single uh, item here. 
So you take these two hashes and uh, you add that to the hash of D. And after you insert this, we kind of form a new, <coughs> we form, form a new uh, tree here. So we hash these previous two nodes and now we kind of form a new tree here by inserting this one. So we hash these two again and we get this new tree hash, right? And we continue doing this. So if you insert a new one, you just take this free hash here and you add that to the, to the hash. So this is a really clever data structure and don't worry about it if you don't understand it completely, but this is really important. By just trusting the last bottom node, you implicitly trust everything before you because this hash and the, and the bottom uh, nodes to the right uh, hashes everything before it. So if you just get that hash and you trust it, you can verify everything before you. Um, and also, since it's a binary tree, at most, we need around uh, log n hashes to verify any content in this data structure. So let's say I trust, just for fun, let's say I trust a, 8, then I implicitly trust uh, 3. So if I wanted to <coughs> verify 2, I just need to get this B block from anybody, and I get, need to get this two block, uh, the zero block, just the hash from anybody, and if I hash them together, I get this hash, and if I hash these two together, I get this hash, and then I just need to get this hash from anybody, it doesn't matter, and if I hash these together, these two together, I just need to verify that this adds up to the free hash that I got from anybody, and if it adds up to this free hash, I just need to ha uh, add that to my E block and check that it matches the eighth block and then I can verify anything. So, <clears throat> another really cool thing about this is that it fits in a list. So as you can see here, you can number it like this, where you say zero, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, and here's, there's gonna be a seven here at some point, and an eight here. So you can really easily fit this into any list. As long as you have a list data structure, you can just put this tree in there. So it's a really clever data structure. Um, <coughs> and like I said, <coughs> you just need to sign one node. If you just trust one node, you cannot trust the, the entire thing. Um, I put peer vision here, it's kind of premature. Don't worry about that. So if you just have a public key and you add that to the feed and a private key, you just need to, to sign the latest node and then you sign the entire tree. So that's kind of cool. And yeah, so thanks for Dominic for showing me this. So I had to implement this. And it's called a flat tree. I put it on NPM last week. And it implements this data structure. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to do live streaming. So that's kind of fun. Uh, distributed, because that means that we can now publish data and trust it uh, and update kind of like a torrent. So I call this peer vision because it's like television, but it's using peers. And it's also visionary. Uh, in my opinion. Uh, so it's a work in progress, uh, like I said, and it's a torrent like protocol that uses that data structure to implement uh, uh, distributed live content. So I'm gonna try a demo of that. I did the last commit to this at 3 a.m. last night, so who knows, who knows if it works, but let's try it anyways. So uh, live streaming a video, I only have like, 10 minutes left, so if you're really tired, don't, I'm sorry for going on so long. Um, so, turns out live streaming video is really hard because of encodings. So I'm just gonna try to live stream some music because music is really easy. I don't know if, it, if it's by design, but you can just concatenate two MP3 files and it plays both, I found out. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like the browser probably, which, you know, it's probably not by design, but it just works because it's terrible. Um, so I have this album that I bought. So what I can do here is, whoa, I'm gonna use, split it like this instead. What I can do here is I can call peer vision, and if I, I remember the commands correctly, uh, I can tell this guy to be a producer. So there are two kinds of uh, peers. There's a producer peer and a viewer peer. 
And there can only be one producer, and the producer produces a private key and a public key that kind of signs this, um, this uh, feed. And the idea of the feed is just a hash of this public key, because this public key verifies these hashes. So if you trust, this, if you trust the hash, then you trust the public key, then you trust that the public key signs these uh, uh, streaming feeds. So what you can do here is you can just hopefully take, uh, actually I need to, you can give it a path to a file. You can, it supports any stream, but right now it does just a file interface. And uh, it takes this file and it chunks this into 16 kilobyte chunks and it puts that into this uh, 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 data structure that I talked about. And then on, a, on, another, um, on another peer, I'm just gonna use the same computer, I can just call peer vision and it uses this uh, web, uh, uh, WebRTC swarm that I talked about earlier to like auto discover each other. I can just call viewer and right now, I just implicit, implicitly trust all public keys. It shouldn't do that, but that was just easiest to get this work. Uh, that kind of breaks security, but who cares? So you can do this magic batch syntax here where you can say, hey, pretend this stream here is a file, and it just works. So it converts it into this. So now, now my computer is playing this song that this other guy here is, uh, is broadcasting. So if I just pause that for a second. So what we can do here is that we can go to this live streaming guy here and we can scroll up and find the folder name and we can scroll up again eh, and we can find another song and we can append that song to the to the feed, and if I play this guy again down here, I can now scroll ahead. And this is now the second song. I know that, but you don't know that. But uh, we're now sticking into the second song. And why? Actually, I think we reached the end now of both songs. So it's, uh, this, the stream is just pausing. So I wonder if it works if I append another one. I haven't tested that. Uh, I just skipped ahead before uh, an M player. Um, so let's try just for fun doing it. Let's just append this podcast here. Prophets of Doom. That sounds good. Maybe. So My it continues playing this uh, live feed. Basically what happened uh, is this. we finished up the last series. You can actually see here this, it's still distributing the these uh, hashes was, you know, because there's a bunch of hashes now because for us to do those five pro this, uh, this file that I just appended was like 400 megabytes, 200 megabytes, sorry, uh, MP3 file, right? So we can distribute any live feeds and we can seek in them using this data structure and we get trust by just having a, a public key and a private key. And it doesn't matter who signed this, private key and public key just allows us, to, allows us to know that only one guy is publishing this feed. So that's great. So that's live streaming. And um, if I can find my slides again. Yeah, so like I said, uh, it's live streaming. And this is actually, the interface is not right now, but this is actually um, uh, transport agnostic. So it works on, over any stream that you can pipe. Uh, that you can connect to computers with. And that means that you can run this in the browser because you can just browserify it. It also means that it can run on a Chromecast. So luck hopefully in the next few weeks, I'll be able to have this running on a Chromecast that you can just plug in your TV and then you can stream video to your TV uh, distributed. So we can finally get rid of all these TV stations that shows all this crappy reality TV um, and have some true programming channels that people can just post programming, programming videos on instead. Yeah, so like I said, it's on GitHub. It's under heavy development, uh, so don't use it yet. It'll probably pwn your computer. Um, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the great talk, uh, Mafetosh. Are there any questions? 
I think you're still a little bit around us for lunchtime now? Or? Yeah, sure. So, um, feel free to ask me anything. And if you uh, feel, if, if you think I'm completely wrong in everything I said, just say that also. I like people saying that. Um, also, the, uh, all of this stuff is on GitHub. And the torrent docker is on GitHub. And uh, I have 10 more BitTorrent demos on GitHub. And if you want to watch live, uh, if you want to watch video over BitTorrent, there's also a bunch of stuff like that on Git, my GitHub. So check it out. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>